So before we start, could you please confirm to me that you are able to hear me properly and that the screen, you can see the screen. Anyone inbox me, please, in the chat box. Okay, thank you, Dr. Samia, Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Ramona, thank you very much. So today we will discuss uh, some lectures, okay? First of all, we'll start with an introduction to communication skills. It's very important that you understand the station and that you understand what the examiners are looking for and what the interview structure you need to follow in order to fulfill the criteria, okay? So the first uh, 30 minutes, uh, I will discuss about the exam, about the station and give you a general backbone for the communication station. Uh, as I mentioned in the uh, material I sent to you, uh, which was sent to your emails, um, you will ne need to take notes with me as I explained lectures, okay? You need to uh, uh, write down uh, very important information, which I'm going to say, okay? Uh, I will discuss some tricks uh, and uh, how to deal with that. So first of all, uh, I will go through discussing the introduction about the station and what we will take and what we will learn in the course. After that, uh, I will present a general scheme for the communication station. And then after that, we will start with our, we will have a break. And after that, we will start our first lecture, which is how to break that news. And it will be followed by practicing scenarios. We will practice uh, around four scenarios and how to break bad news. And uh, also a discussion about palliative care and hospice care will also follow. So uh, we will finish, uh, our, our session today will be five hours long, but we will have breaks in between for refreshment and uh, if you want to pray or eat something or just refresh, okay? So here we go. All right, the case must be a com common clinical scenario. And it, it's not gonna be, um, it's not gonna be obscure uh, and complex. It's gonna be something common, general, because it's not your knowledge which is going to be tested here uh, uh, as much as your communication skills and your knowledge about ethics and legal issues. All right, so usually the scenario will be a common clinical scenario. Okay, every one of you uh, knows the basics about it. It's not gonna be obscure, not a complex one, and there should be a well-defined task, okay? A well-defined task will be given to you. I will explain to you how to uh, break down the scenario and how to analyze the task card in order to know what you need to do, okay? And how to plan your answer. So um, while some appreciation of law is required, okay? There are things you need to know. But it's not expected that you will have the knowledge of a lawyer, of course, okay? So uh, very few minute details are not required. Just need to know the basic uh, uh, things. We will discuss all of them, of course, uh, throughout our course. While there are many possible cases, it's perhaps useful to know that in broad terms, the sort of case you are likely to get in this section can be subdivided in the following categories. So the cases or the case scenarios you will face in the station for exam will follow in one of these seven categories okay we'll discuss them all so as you can see the categories in green here okay these are very uh, uh rich uh, exam material all right so we'll discuss them thoroughly and then we will go through some rare scenarios okay they appear very rarely in the exam uh, maybe they don't appear in the exam, but however, as they uh, uh, actually came uh, in the 2018, so I included them and we will have a brief discussion over them in the last lecture, all right? But throughout the course, we will practice all these uh, uh, green areas, which are category one, breaking bad news, all right? In this course, uh, as uh, as you know, it's very important that you have a knowledge knowledge of the basics of the communication and ethics, and then you build on your postgraduate exam preparation for the PACES level. But what happens is that over 
these candidates, okay, uh, many of them, they didn't actually receive a basic undergraduate education in communication and ethics as uh, provided in uh, uh, other universities. Uh, uh, okay, so that's why I will take you back to the basics of the ethics and communication skills. And after that, we will build on our preparation to meet the requirements for PACES exam. So what matters to me is that you have basic knowledge first and that your performance and preparation is based on understanding, okay, not just memorizing the answer from uh, uh, practicing scenarios, okay? So because of that, each, each one of these categories, okay, uh, it may come as a task to you in the exam. So your task will be to bring the bad news to the patient, for example. So in the course, it's going to be lecture. All right. So first of all, I'll explain to you the key steps, the guidelines, what you need to know. All right. And then after that, we will practice scenarios for the PACES exam. The second category is uh, to explain the diagnosis of a given disease or to explain a management plan or to give the patient an advice according uh, to that, okay? Uh, I'll teach you how to do that. Whatever the diagnosis was, there is a common backbone for explaining how to explain a diagnosis in the exam, okay? Whether if it was a common disease or if it was a very rare disease, just follow these steps and you'll be safe, all right? And then category three is uh, how to deal with difficult patients. Uh, it could be angry patients or angry relatives, okay? Uh, we also have a lecture uh, about that. Category four, uh, we'll, we'll discuss ethical and legal issues, all right? It's very important that you have a good understanding of these because you may uh, uh, get some tricky uh, uh, questions from the examiner to test your uh, knowledge about ethical and legal issues. So this will also be discussed in very much detail in the course. Category five, okay, where uh, there is, uh, you will be given a general clinical issue and you will be asked to uh, discuss, for example, um, you will be given uh, a card where there is, the scenario is about a patient who is suffering from um, a chronic disease and uh, this patient is not complying with his medications and uh, you need to discuss, uh, how to counsel this patient and deal with his concerns, okay? That's an example. Uh, there are other examples which we, we, you will, you will uh, know them uh, as we go through the course. Category six where you will be asked to um, obtain an informed consent from the patient for a certain given procedure, okay? I will also explain to you uh, uh, the guidelines and key steps uh, among the general clinical issues, how you explain a procedure, how you um, deal with uh, several situations, okay? I'll, I'll just show you the index uh, in a few seconds. The seventh category is professional issues in communication with colleagues. So here I'll explain to you uh, some some ethical points um, when you deal with a colleague who was found to be, uh, for example, hepatitis B or C positive, and uh, how to deal with a colleague colleague who uh, got a needle stick injury, for example. And some um, we'll have a lecture about infection control, the MRR say, and the Clostridium difficile infection. Uh, also, we'll have a discussion about the postmortem examination uh, and how to counsel a patient uh, and assess his fitness to, to fly, okay? Um, so, this is the um, index of our course, the common scenarios or topics which we'll, we, we will discuss. These are the frequently appearing topics in the exam, all right? Uh, how to break bad news and how to discuss palliative care how to explain a diagnosis, explain a procedure or a new treatment, non-compliance with medication and how to deal with that, how to uh, counsel a patient with a chronic illness and what things you may face in, in such scenarios and where to start from and how to plan your answer. Safety in pregnancy is also very important. I will explain that too. Counseling functional disorder, okay, where you will be given a uh, 
uh, a functional disorder and uh, like the uh, irritable bowel syndrome is a very frequently appearing topic uh, nowadays it can uh, it, it came as a history and it also came as communication uh, scenario how to deal with an angry patient how to deal when adverse drug reactions occur how to uh, deal with medical error okay all that will be explained ethical principles, end-of-life decisions, DNR decisions, withdrawal of treatment, brainstem death and organ donation, confidentiality. We'll have a lecture about confidentiality and uh, fitness to drive, genetic counseling, how to do that, obtaining consent, how to obtain a consent, and then the miscellaneous topics, as I explained, Jehovah's Witness, air travel, hospital, superbug, postmortem examination, colleague with hepatitis B infection, needle stick injury. And now to explain a situation, for example, a medical error happened or an uncompliance or brainstem death, withdrawal of treatment, etc. All right. So each one of these may present as a task in the exam. Each one of these in our course is a lecture. Okay. So let's go through the uh, PACES station. In brief, you know, you have five stations. Station one, the respiratory and abdominal examination, 10 minutes each. And then you have five minutes interval. Then you will enter into station two, which is the history taken. This is what Dr. Tan explains. Uh, 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 it's included in his course. And then five minutes interval, station three, cardiovascular and, neuro and uh, neurological examination, 10 minutes each. After that, you have a five minute interval and then our station, which is the communication skills and ethics. Okay, it's 20 minutes long. You will be given 14 minutes with the surrogate and then you have one minute for reflection of your answer. Afterwards, you will have five minutes to discuss your performance with the examiners. After that, another five minutes interval and then you go through uh, to station five where we have two uh, cases. So this is a close up of station four, okay? Our practicing will start from the five minutes before entering the room, all right, from here, all right? So we will, I will teach you how to approach the station even before you enter into the examination room, okay? So it's written five minutes, but in fact, it might be even uh, let's it's it's the interval between two stations when you uh, it's, it's an organizing uh, station an organization between when you exit from a station and you prepare yourself to enter to the next one so it could be four minutes it could be three minutes okay uh, so we will start I will start when we practice the scenarios I will start by giving you five minutes to plan your answer after that I will minimize the duration. Then I will start to give you four minutes before the station. After that, we will minimize it to three minutes, okay? So that you get used to uh, a plan when you are under pressure. So five minutes before entering the room, you need to read the task card and plan your consultation. I'll teach you how to do that. After that, you will enter into the exam room. You will find the surrogate sitting and waiting for you, and you will find two examiners. Okay, so the duration is 14 minutes. This is the time you will spend with the surrogate. So here you have to spend these to do the consultation with the surrogate before they leave the room. When the 14 minutes are over, the surrogate will leave the room and leave you with the, with the examiners. So you'll be given time check after 12 minutes, the examiner will remind you that you still have two minutes left. So after 12 minutes, the examiner will say you have two minutes left. So here you have to finish whatever you are doing. If you didn't ask about something important, you have to do that. You have to start summarizing your consultation. You have to uh, um, make sure that the patient is recapping what you have just said to him that he's understanding. You have to end your consultation in a professional way. And I'll teach you how to do that, okay? Then you have one minute for reflection and organizing your answer before your five minutes for discussion with the examiner start. All right. So sometimes when you enter into the exam room, you may find more than two examiners. You may find four examiners. Okay. So uh, don't get panics. Panic. Uh, um, sometimes some examiners are uh, um, being trained to become examiners. So they are 
attending the exam. But in fact, you have two examiners who are going to evaluate you. All right. So these are the marking criteria, which we are what we are going to work throughout the course on these marking criteria. I will explain them now, okay, so that your performance during the course and when we practice this, the scenarios must be according to this marking sheet, these marking criteria. I took these marking criteria from the, uh, a copy of the marking sheets of the communication station. <clears throat> I sent you the link on the email which Dr. Ahmed sent you uh, yesterday, I guess, okay? Just open the link and you will find the mark sheet, a copy of the mark sheet for station four. These criteria, I took them from the same marking sheet, but I printed them out here and I magnified the words in the mark sheets just to make them more clear so that you can focus on them, okay? So number one, marking criteria. Number one, you will be marked for your clinical communication skills. This is what I'm going to teach you in the course and what we are going to practice about, practice on, okay? You need to express relevant clinical information, okay, according to the given scenario. It will be given a scenario about, as we said, a common clinical uh, um, problem, all right, from everyday practice. So you have to express the relevant clinical information in an accurate, clear, comprehensive, fluent, and professional manner. What is the meaning of that? Accurate means that your words need to be correct. Accurate, you, you, clear means that you are not using medical jargon. Okay, you are using uh, uh, layman um, terms. Comprehensive means that the patient is actually, or the surrogate is understanding what you're saying. The surrogate's understanding is perfect and he's following you and he got the point and, okay, because it's important that the surrogate leaves the station uh, um, and he understood everything you told him and you asked about all his concerns and he got all his concerns uh, answered and solved so that when he leaves the station, he got something to, th to think about. He needs a package. The patient needs a package to think about till the next appointment, okay? It, you must leave the station uh, with all his questions answered. You need to be fluent, okay? So you need to practice and practice and practice even after the course. The course will provide you with tips and tricks and key steps and guidelines and I will explain the legal and ethical issues. We will, uh, as we said, practice a lot of scenarios, but after the course is over, you need to take all these skills and continue practicing and practicing so that you are more and more fluent. Fluency is very important in the exam, okay? And you have to do it in a professional manner, which means you have to have the correct skills, okay? So that's why I will provide you with uh, uh, what I call blocks, okay? This block, it, it contains the key steps uh, um, in, a, in a way so that it's easy to memorize them and make your uh, flow of your performance flowing uh, a very or in a very organized uh, manner and in a professional way. All right, here, accurate and clear and comprehensive. I'll give you an example. For example, you are asked to uh, bring the bad news to the patient about a cancer, okay? So here, you need to avoid saying a tumor or a mass or a growth, okay? You have to say it's cancer because everyone knows what cancer is. Even the non-medical uh, people out there in the community, okay? All of them knows what cancer is, but not everyone knows what the growth is. They may underestimate the word. So you have to make it clear that it is actually cancer. Cancer is, they know that cancer is bad. Cancer is malignancy, okay? So avoid medical jargon. When you say cancer, it, it's accurate, okay? They got the point. They got the exact diagnosis. You were clear with that and they understood what you said, okay? But let's say you said it's a tumor or it's a growth. Maybe they, they get it as a swelling or something which is not very serious, all right? So that's why it's not gonna be comprehensive. Okay, that's just an example. And then number two, among mar the second marking criteria is the managing patient's concerns. Please, in all talking stations, 
when whenever you are going to talk with the surrogate, either in station two or station four or in station five, you must ask about the concerns, okay? Because there is, uh, like here, it's a section about concerns. If you didn't ask uh, a dire question about the patient's concerns or the surrogate's concerns, you will lose this section. You will not be marked for it, okay? So managing patients' concerns. As you can see, it's written here, managing concerns, which means it's not enough to ask what their concerns are, but you have to solve them. You have to manage their concerns. You have to make, ha provide a solution for their problems. So they will mark you whether if you are able to seek the concerns, detect their concerns, acknowledge them, and attempt to address the patient's or relative's concerns, okay? If the surrogate's concerns, whether if it is, if the surrogate is the patient or the surrogate is the relative, you have to ask about the surrogate's concern, okay? Whoever you are interviewing. You must show that you listen. When you ask them about their concerns, you have to avoid interrupting them, let them speak and listen to them. And then you have to respond accordingly. Okay, they will mark you if you're able to confirm the patient's or relative's knowledge and understanding. Did you confirm that they are following you, that they are understanding what you said, that you asked if invited questions to clarify unclear issues? Okay, and then the summary and recap at the end. Did you do that? Did you check their understanding? Especially if there are so many uh, details in the discussion. And then showing empathy. It's important that you show empathy. As you can see, it's written here in the mark sheet. Okay, some candidates didn't pass the station because they didn't show empathy. And it, it was written in the feedback that they explained everything very well, but they didn't show empathy. So empathy is very important. What's the meaning of empathy? And what's the difference between empathy and sympathy? Empathy means, or being empathic, means that you put yourself in the patient's shoes, okay? You show empathy means that you show that you, um, you tell the patient that you understand how he feels, you understand that you just told him awful news, you understand it must be very difficult for him to handle them, and uh, then you offer help. So you do it like this. For example, you just told a patient that he has cancer and the patient, I will explain this in, 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 the, in the next um, lecture, okay? But I'm just giving an example here. You tell him that he, he got cancer and then you just give them uh, silence, okay? Uh, to absorb the um, news. And then after that, you check their feelings. Could you please tell me how you feel now? I understand this must be very difficult to, ha to handle. I just gave you such bad news. I'm very sorry for that. I understand it, it must be very, very uh, difficult, but could you please tell me how you feel? I'm here to help you. Me and my team, we are here. We will not leave you alone. We will support you and we will help you. So. Okay, so this is how you show empathy. And when you do that, please, you, have, you need to change your tone of voice. You have to be empathic, it means that the patient is crying or he is devastated to receive such bad news that he has cancer. So you cannot do it with a happy tone of voice or a careless tone of voice. You need to adjust your body language. You need to adjust your voice, tone of voice, according to the situation. So when you acknowledge the feelings, acknowledge the difficulty of the situation and the bad news you just gave him, and then you provide them, you reassure them. And then you reassure them that you are going to help them, okay? Uh, you and your team. That's empathy. So you acknowledge and then you provide help. But sympathy means that simply saying, I'm sorry for that. The patient says that 
he lost a beloved one uh, last year, or he said that, doctor, I, I, I got this awful headache. I couldn't sleep since yesterday. Okay, I'm sorry for that. That's sympathy, okay? So empathy, being empathic, is even more deep. Number three, clinical judgment. This is the third marking criteria going to be marked for, okay? Clinical judgment, they will check. The examiners will uh, uh, evaluate you uh, whether if you are able to select or negotiate a sensible and appropriate management plan for the patient or relatives or the clinical situation. Remember, as I said, you will be given uh, a medical problem. The patient in the task card, in the card, in your exam, there will be a scenario about a medical problem, of course. So uh, what is your management plan about that? Let's say a patient presented with Melina. So what was your clinical judgment about the management plan? Okay, because all communication scenarios in all communication scenarios, you must explain a management plan. That's something which is, uh, which, which is there. There's always a management plan you need to exp uh, explain. So was your management plan according to the given disease, was it correct or was it incorrect? Okay, so select, uh, was the candidate able to select or negotiate sensible appropriate management plan for the patient or relative the, or the clinical situation? And the second section is that, was you, did you apply the clinical knowledge, including knowledge of law and ethics specific for the case? So here in the clinical judgment, you'll be judged for your clinical management plan of the scenario as a clinician as a doctor, and then did you do that according to the relevant, appropriate, uh, ethical and legal principles of that given scenario? Okay, so this is what we are going to do throughout the course. Number four, maintaining patient's welfare is the fourth, fourth uh, 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 marking criteria, is the first section, it's very important, okay? that you uh, uh, pay attention to that, which means that were, was the candidate able to treat the patients respectively? And did you show respect? Did you ensure the patient's comfort, safety, and dignity? Let's say, for example, um, a patient who is HIV positive and uh, he was, um, let's say, he was a drug, injecting drugs and uh, he was... Um, um, let's say in the, from the, has a low social class background and he, he was an addict, a, pro, a troublemaker, maybe a prisoner. Okay. However, so here you have to treat them respectively. Ethically, this is justice. Okay. But patients, treating the patients respectively is also important. It applies even to the other people, the normal population, okay, that you treat them with dignity and respect, uh, even if they are angry, how did you deal with that angry person? Okay, you have to deal with them with respect, okay? Uh, enjoy comfort means that um, not making, letting them uh, suffer. Uh, you, make, you have to make sure that um, um, you will help them out. You will ask them how this disease which you just explained or how their medical problem is affecting their way life in any way is it causing them problems at their uh, with their job problems with family maybe marital problems maybe financial problems and how did you solve them how are you going to help them to solve them did you ensure their safety like for example a patient who is not fit to drive did you explain to them that they are not fit to drive Okay, did you, for example, a patient who has epilepsy, did you give them instructions about avoiding to swim unsupervised, to avoid to uh, be at high altitudes, to avoid locking the bathroom from the inside, risk stratification, okay? Did you ensure their safety? Like, I'll explain all these examples through the scenarios, okay? so. Man managing patients' welfare uh, is another way of doing that is, for example, um, uh, let's say a patient, you just uh, told them that they have cancer, just broke bad news. And then uh, after the 
interview is over, you ask them who they have at home for support. Did they have a family at home? How did they come to the hospital? Did they come alone driving? Okay. And if so, they just re receive bad news. Um, maybe you can ask uh, for a taxi or uh, advise them to uh, ask a family member to come and pick them up from the hospital so that you ensure safety, not letting them uh, drive alone home, especially if they don't have a family at home for support after receiving these bad news. Okay, I'll give you a lot and a lot of examples as we go through the course. So these were the marking criteria. Now, this is a general backbone for communication skill scenarios, okay? This backbone is very important. This is the one, uh, it's a common uh, um, structure for um, most communication scenarios. Most of them, in the most scenarios, this is what you have to follow. This is how you show that you are professional. You, do, you are doing it in a professional way, okay? These are the skills. So I started to introduce you to the general backbone of communication skill scenarios from the introduction lecture so that you will follow them as we go throughout the course. Okay, but I will remind you with this structure over and over and over again till you get used to it. So this is how you start the interview. First of all, number one, you greet the patient by good morning or exam is in the morning, you say good morning. Number two, we have to confirm the patient's ID. Why do we confirm the patient's ID? For two reasons. Number one, to um, create a bonding between you and the patient, okay? It's good to be called by your name, all right? And then number two, for confidentiality issues. You have to confirm that you are speaking to the same patient because um, if it was not the correct patient, okay? For example, let's say you are just uh, telling the pa you, you will meet this patient to tell him that he, he has HIV. So assume that you didn't confirm the patient's ID and you gave the wrong information to the wrong patient. This is breach of confidentiality, okay? So you have to confirm his ID. So number one, greet them, then confirm the patient's ID, first and last name. Introduce yourself and tell the patient what your role is. Your role will be given to you in the task card. I'll show you how, okay? Then you have number four, you have to establish rapport. Establishing rapport means that um, you ask them how they are doing now, how they feel. For example, how are you doing? How are you? This is in order to break the ice with the surrogate and start a conversation between the two of you. Number five, you have to set the agenda. Setting the agenda means that you explain to them what the reason for this meeting is. For example, you're here today to discuss about their uh, management plan. You're here to the, uh, today to discuss the results of their, their, their investigation result and so on. Okay, so usually the agenda, you can, you can know the agenda uh, from the task. And this is what will guide you through which skills you'll use. All right. Let's say that your task was to meet this angry patient and explain the situation. Let's say that they had, your task was to meet this patient with, who has a chronic illness and discuss or negotiate a management plan with them. Let's say that your task was to uh, break the bad news and explain the um, results. Okay, so the agenda is about why you are here. Number six, assess understanding. You have to assess how much they, the patient or the surrogate knows about their problem. Find out what he was told so far. And then you have to go on by addressing their ideas, concerns, and expectations. You do it like this. Could you please, for example, Mr. Muhammad uh, Ali, okay? Uh, Mr. Muhammad Ali, could you please uh, um, um, tell me what you know so far about what's going on with you lately? Did anyone explain to you what the problem is? Um, could you please tell me? All right, so here you ask them how much they, they know so far. So they will start to let you know. At first, I was having a tummy problem, and then I went to my 
examined me, find, for example, a lump in, in, my, in my tummy, and he referred me to the gastro uh, clinic, gastroenterology clinic, to be tested further. And there they found out so and so and so. Okay. Then you ask them, okay, what do you have any idea about what it might be, or what do you uh, do you have any expectations about what this might be? Okay, you have to ask this question even before you start your explanation. So this is how you need to do it. So number one, greet the patient, confirm his ID, introduce yourself, tell what your role is. It will be a given to you in the task card. Establish reports at the agenda and then assess understanding. Assess their eyes, ideas, concerns and expectations. Have you any idea what's going on? Did anyone explain to you what's going on? These are example sentences you can use. And then after they answer the question, carry on by telling the patient his own story from the information you got from the card and the patient himself. So here you need to explain and do your, sh your share, whatever your task is. If it was to break the bad news, so here you have to use the specific skills of breaking bad news. If your task was to explain the diagnosis, so you need to use the specific skills to explain a diagnosis. Each one of them is provided in a lecture, a separate lecture in our course. Explain a procedure or new treatment, you have to use the specific skills for that. For example, apologize for medical error, deal with an angry patient, etc. All right, this is number seven. So the first six steps are the same for nearly all communication scenarios. I'll show you the exceptions as we go uh, with the lectures. So the difference, the only difference is number seven. After seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, till 13, till the end, are common again. So the difference is number seven, where according to your given task, you have to add in specific tasks, okay, to break the bad news or explain diagnosis. After that, you will get back to the backbone, the general backbone, and set the plan of management. Remember, as I told you, all communication scenarios have a management plan, which you need to explain. So it's always there. And this is the clinical judgment marking what you are going to be marked for, how you select, negotiate a sensible, appropriate management, management plan for the given scenario, and how you applied the uh, uh, related ethical and legal aspects. So set the plan of management, even what, what are you going to do about this? case. How are you going to manage this patient? How are you going to counsel him and explain his, man his management plan? The treatment, including the follow-up plan. So even if it includes meeting the consultant and other consultants from other specialties, even if it included the multidisciplinary team to help in the management, you have to explain that. Okay? Number nine, you have to assess the concerns and questions again. So ask about the eyes, ideas, concerns, and expectations before you do the task. After you assess their understanding, ask them, what do you expect? Do you have any expectations what the problem might be? Okay, and after that, you do your task. And then you explain the management plan, and then you assess if they have any concerns again. So asking the surrogate if they have any concerns. Uh, from the beginning, before you explain, and after the explanation, of course, there must be uh, um, the, there might be new concerns ar rising up after they heard the information from you. All right. So, and invite questions. Ask the surrogate what he thinks of what you said. If he has any ideas, any opinions, any concerns, any fears or questions, and deal with them. Okay. This is very important to do in the exam. Number 10, ask if the information supplied or decisions taken in the management plan affects his life in any way and offer help accordingly. That will give you the mark of welfare. I'll give you an example. A lady who is um, 70 or maybe 68 years old, she came to the hospital with a back pain. After investigating her and making, making some imaging to her spine, uh, a bone mitts was discovered, all right? And this lady, she had breast cancer 20 years ago and it was cured, it was treated 20 years ago, but now she came with 
back pain and it, uh, the diagnosis was uh, a metastatic uh, a spine lesion. All right. So you break the bad news. You tell her it's cancer. The cancer is bad and it's uh, uh, spread and it reaches the spine. And among the management plan, you explain to her that she needs to be admitted in the hospital and receive treatment for further investigation and management. And when you ask her here how this information is supplied or decision taking, what's her opinion about what you said regarding her management plan? How would that affect her life in any way? She tells you that she refuses to be admitted. She cannot stay in the hospital. You ask why, she says that she has her husband, yeah, her husband, uh, he is a post stroke. He, he had a stroke some time ago and he's bedridden and he's totally dependent on her. Okay, she feeds him, she cleans him. He cannot move by, uh, by himself. And if she uh, um, stayed in the hospital, nobody is going to take care of her husband. So here comes your role. You provide help, you offer help, okay? So by that, uh, uh, you showed empathy and, you, and also you uh, scored the welfare mark. What, how is that? Because you ensure the safety of your patient, you solved her concern. How would you do that? You just tell her, reassure her that we will not let her suffer, neither uh, uh, leave her husband uh, alone without any uh, care or help. So we will contact if they have, of course, you have to ask if they have any family member who can stay with her husband during her hospital stay. If there is no one to do that, then you will you reassure her that you and your team are here to provide help and you can contact the social service. You will contact the social services to take care of her husband. Maybe someone can take care of him at home or maybe he can stay in a nursing home, for example, uh, during his, her hospital stay. So by that way, you encourage her, you solve her problem. By that, she will uh, um, uh, agree to be admitted to hospital, receive her care with dignity and respect Okay, and also you ensure the safety and dignity and the respect of her husband as well. Okay. So when you ask the patient how this may affect their life in any way, or for example, um, how you, you need to provide help, help and support to solve their concerns. So this is a list, okay, of whom you can get help from in order to support and help the patient, okay? Mm -hmm. Help and support can be gained from group therapy, all right? So that, by the end of the consultation, after you explain your management plan, you ask about their concerns, okay? If they have any questions, fears, problems, how this may affect their life in any way, listen to the surrogate and what he's going to say. So wh whatever problems they have, okay, help, and support can be provided through, for example, group therapy. You, you give them contact details of some group therapy, according, of course, of, according to the given disease in the scenario. Uh, the contact details of medical societies. Remember, all diseases have a society, like the MS Society, for example. Okay, contact details of the Parkinson's Disease Society, the Ulcerative Colitis Society, the Myasthenia Gravis Society, etc. These will uh, be support them and be by their side in their difficult times, all right? If they needed any help, they can contact these medical societies. So provide contact details in the station by the end of the consultation. Example, we can join the MS Society and see how people are coping with their condition, okay? Another appointment to discuss new decisions, for example, is another way to provide help and support. Walking aids, occupational therapy, okay? A patient, for example, who, who finds difficulty um, in um, staying ambulant or uh, difficulty uh, moving around because of his disease, okay, occupational therapy can provide walking aids. And, uh, so you, you give contact details of these or you, or you can contact them in order to, to support this patient. Okay, support groups are also available, special nurses like Macmillan nurses. These are specialist nurses 
uh, who deal and support cancer patients. Nursing homes are also another mean of providing support. Okay, these are usually the arrangement for nursing homes can be done through the social workers and so. Salt tea, which is the speech and language therapy, like for example, Parkinson's patients with Parkinson's disease may need salt tea. Okay, uh, safe sex is also another mean of providing health and support. Rehabilitating programs like uh, epilepsy rehab programs, like for example, post-MI rehab programs, physiotherapy, organ transplantation, social service, dietary advice, all these are uh, there to provide help and support according to the given scenario, okay? This is a collection, as uh, um, let's say, examples of some uh, where you can get help and support uh, through giving the contact details to the patient. Number 11, you have to summarize the whole scenario with your suggested plan and recap. Summarize to the patient what we just discussed or ask them to, if they understood, uh, what, what did you gain from our discussion today? To assess their understanding before you close the interview, okay? Including the suggested plan, of course. Number 12, close the consultation by offering contact details of your clinic, of the contact details of the specialist nurse of the clinic. If it was given in the scenario that you are seeing the patient in the rheumatology clinic, give contact details of the rheumatology specialist nurse of the rheumatology clinic. So the patient can get back to you if something happened before the appointment or so that we don't lose the patient. There's always contact how we can get back to you, all right? Uh, contact details, for example, if you're referring him to another specialty, to another clinic, according to the scenario. Then follow up referral appointments. Leaflets, pamphlets, website, these are written information which you should provide. This is how you close the interview professionally, okay? You have to do these three steps. By the end, when you will close the consultation, when the examiner says that you have two minutes left, you should be on this page. You should uh, summarize and recap, close the consultation by offering contact details, follow up referral appoint or referral appointment according to scenario, provide written information like leaflet, pamphlets, website to the surrogate for further information where they can uh, get more information to read about what we just discussed about. Okay, finally, ask them if they have any further questions, if they are uh, uh, happy with your explanation, if um, um, there is still something which they find uh, still not clear. I mean, are you happy with my explanation? Okay, do you have any further questions? Uh, can I help you in any other way? Okay, and finally, thank the patient, wish them best of luck, or seeing them again according to scenario. So this is the frame or the backbone, these steps again. From one to six, this is the introduction. This is how you introduce your station in the exam. You have to do these steps, okay? You will be marked for each one of them. If you forget one of them, then it will be, uh, uh, I mean, you will lose marks, all right? You have to do a perfect introduction. And, and there are very easy steps, easy to memorize. And they will show that you are very professional. And then here is the, uh, what needs to, uh, I mean, this needs more explanation, more training and so on, okay? Because each task needs specific skills. So this is what I'm going to teach you. And then set the plan of management again, eight, nine, and 10, 11, 12, and 13, or again, common steps for the, uh, most of the scenarios, all right? Examiners will expect you to have knowledge about the ethical issues in the scenario. All right, what's the ethical or principle or dilemma in this case? So we have four ethical principles, which is the autonomy. Autonomy means that um, the patient's self-rule. The patient should be able to decide for himself as long as he has a sound mind, he's over 16 years of age, the age of maturity, and um, able to decide for himself and he's competent. I'll explain all these in detail later on, okay? so. You must respect his uh, uh, which his autonomy. 
okay? Whether if he uh, uh, refuse or agree or whatever, as long he, as he is able to decide for himself and he is competent, you have to respect his autonomy. Beneficence means that you do what is in the what is good for the patient, what is in his best in his benefit. Non-maleficence means to avoid harm. Okay, your decision, your management should be based on avoiding harm, harming the patient either physically or uh, uh, psychologically or socially or emotionally. Okay, no harm. And justice, uh, justice here means that um, every patient has the right to receive medical care regardless of his sex or age or race or color or okay uh, everyone you have to treat uh, all patients with dignity and respect and equally all right other legal issues so these are the ethical issues one two three four ethical issues other legal issues okay which may be in the scenario are uh, some confidentiality issues related to confidentiality. I'll explain them in the confidentiality lecture. Capacity, for example, uh, deciding the patient's best interest, uh, and so on. All right? Remember, in the hypothetical world of the PACES exam, you will have access to almost unlimited resources, which include specialist nurses are available, information leaflets are available, patients' associations, etc. So assume that everything is available for you. All right, it's a, we are acting. It's a hypothetical world, okay? So uh, assume that everything you need is available for you. Like this list, for example, regardless of where you work in, in, in the real world, regardless of your working circumstances, the hospital or the country you're working in, and the basis exam, assume that they are available for you, okay? so. You will have access to almost unlimited resources. And uh, so common mistakes or pitfalls for station four for candidates is that they are being in a hurry. They forget, forget to ask, ask all the questions needed and they cannot complete the task as asked it. So the task is very important that you, you read it very thoroughly. You have to answer all the parts, all the sections of the task. Your task may have only one order. Your task may have two to three commands, so you have to respond to all of them. You have to read the task very thoroughly. Number two, the second mistake is repeating. Always try to rephrase. Don't repeat and repeat it under stress, okay? It's difficult to, to avoid that, but by practicing and practicing for the day of the exam, you will get to, used to that. Uh, th the third mistake is using medical jargon. So try to avoid that. Number four, finishing the station before the 14 minutes are up. So that's why you have to follow this backbone, okay, to fill, fill the time. Usually the stations and the key and the answers and your performance are measured uh, uh, about 14 minutes. So if you're doing it correctly and properly, then you'll finish around 14 minutes. Number five, forgetting to ask about social aspects. And here, it's not so taking social history. You should not take social history, but you should ask about social aspects. For example, how this will affect their life in any way, like driving, like uh, their family life, job issues, financial challenges, marital problems. What about, for example, a patient who has Parkinson's disease and he has a shuffling gait and difficult tendency to fall, for example, and he lives in a house which is all of stairs. Okay, this is important here to ask a question like this so that you can get the help of occupational therapist. All right, for example, a patient who needs help at his workplace, it's important to ask about how he's doing and the effect of his disease on his work so that you can uh, advise him to contact his occupational health office and maybe they will help them relocate them and so on okay so that's why we ask about social aspects it's not just to take social history no it's to get the welfare mark okay smoking also we ask about smoking smoking is always bad so whenever the patient says that he smokes you have to offer smoking cessation clinic okay uh alcohol it's important 
in some scenarios, okay, sometimes you need to stop alcohol. Sometimes they need to cut down alcohol. Let's say, for example, you, got, you get a scenario about TB and the new diagnosis was tuberculosis. You were explaining the management plan. You were explaining the treatment plan. And you, you didn't ask about alcohol. The patient was drinking uh, 20 units of alcohol a week. And uh, to anti-tuberculous drugs are metabolized by the liver and the patient is exceeding the limit of alcohol, which is allowed per week. So you should, you should ask about alcohol and you should advise them to stop drinking. And if they are not able to do that on their, on their own, you, you need to provide help. Okay, someone need to help them to cut down alcohol during receiving or taking these medications. Okay, these were just examples. We have a lot of scenarios uh, to demonstrate that. Okay, uh, references will be provided uh, for you so that you can practice more and more. Okay, these are our references. So this was the introduction. Uh, uh, this was the introduction lecture, okay? Uh, I'll give you some few minutes if you have any questions so far before we start with the Breaking Bad News uh, lecture. So any questions, please inbox me in the chat box. All right, welcome, Dr. Amona. Um, I'll give you five minutes, five minutes break, okay? And then we will start with our breaking bad news. See you after five minutes. Okay, Dr. Mohammed is asking, should we ask about past history medication list? I'll explain to you when you need to ask about medication, okay? It's not, it's not uh, we don't do that always in communication, but it's significant and relevant. Uh, sometimes I explain to you that, all right, when, when the time comes. <clears throat> 